as was said by, well, thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Carol. Um, as was said already, my name is Martin Collins and I'm the co-director of Paddy Point Traveller and uh, Roma Centre. So maybe just to give you um, a sense of who we are, because I'm not going to make any assumptions that everybody in the room would be familiar with or would know about the work of Paddy Point. So just for a few moments, I'll, I'll speak about the work of Paddy Point and some of the principles and the values which, which inform that work. Uh, Pavy Point was established in 1985. In fact, this year we will be celebrating our 30th anniversary. Um, so we have hope a number of events uh, lined up uh, later on in the year uh, to celebrate uh, uh, that uh, milestone. Um, it's a national uh, NG uh, NGO. It works at both a local level, a regional level, a national level, and indeed we work at an international level. And so in other words, we develop alliances uh, and we work in solidarity with other indigenous groups, indeed, not just at a European level, but also at a global level. So we would have alliances and links with other indigenous groups, such as the Maori community, the uh, Aboriginal, uh, Aboriginal community, Native Americans, and of course, the Roma, Sinti and Gypsy, and, and other tribal groups right uh, across Europe. We also obviously uh, produce shadow reports to various UN and Council of Europe uh, human rights bodies, such as CERD, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, uh, the Framework Convention on the Protection of National Minorities, and so on. So we've always attempted, if you like, to interna internationalise the travel question and the travel issues, and to get international uh, 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 eminent human rights bodies to make uh, comments and recommendations to the Irish state in terms of how they should address um, travel issues. It's a partnership organisation. It's comprised of travellers and non-travellers who share a particular vision and understanding of, of the traveller situation uh, and, and how that should be and how that should be addressed. And when I say it's a partnership organisation, um, it's not a numbers game. It's not necessarily meaning that there's four travellers at the table and four non-travellers negotiating around a, partic a particular issue. That in itself is not necessarily uh, participation. Uh, you know, that you could have one traveller at the table and you could have four non-travellers and that might be more of an equal uh, and meaningful uh, uh, partnership approach. So in other words, there's a particular dynamic that still has to be managed around that partnership approach between travellers and non-travellers. You know, and it's, it, it requires ongoing focus uh, and maintenance, in, in fact, because there's still a, you know, uh, a power differential there uh, between the two communities and we all bring you know our own perspectives uh, to the table so it's just there's a particular dynamic that that we still have to struggle with in terms of you know creating that that that, that uh, equal partnership approach one of the core principles that informed the work of Pavi point and has done so right from its very inception all those years ago is the whole notion of cultural rights and the right to one's identity and that's that's of fundamental importance uh, not just uh, the Pavi Point, but indeed to other travel organisations, uh, and, and, and indeed to travellers generally, is the right to have your identity, to have your identity validated and resourced and supported uh, by the state. And in, in that regard, uh, I, I, I have to say that there's a bit of a window now at the moment where Aon uh, O'Reardon, uh, Minister of, of State, has given a, a commitment that within a couple of months that the government will make a, def a definitive uh, statement on this on this issue. There's been a lot of campaigning, there's been a lot of lobbying, a lot of, a lot of negotiating on this issue going back over many years, and indeed international bodies, in fact nearly all of, I think there's nine international human rights bodies within the UN, and at this, at this stage, each and every one of them have recommended that the Irish state uh, should recognise travellers as a distinct ethnic minority, that we meet all of the criteria, all of the anthropological, sociological uh, uh, research, and indeed all of the legal uh, case law in, in, in this area. Uh, travel organisations have made a very compelling case uh, uh, um, as, to why we, as to why we should be recognised as an ethnic minority. The state, when, under recommendation number eight of CERD, uh, which I think was uh, uh, adopted something like 10 years ago, that you have the right to self-identify. And when you self-identify then, the burden of proof rests on the state. So under international law, in particular CERD, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, that if you assert your right to your identity, the burden of proof then rests on the state to disprove your argument. The state thus far have not come up with any cogent uh, logical reason why travel should, should, should not be recognised as an ethnic group. They just basically say that it's of no material benefit. Okay, so we would argue back, if it's of no material or added benefit, then why not just symbolically recognise what is self-evident, and that is that travellers do constitute a distinct ethnic group. And in my opinion, I think the subtext to the narrative around travel issues, in the absence of uh, an unequivocal recognition of travel ethnicity, I still believe that the assimilationist uh, uh, policy and mindset 
uh, persist in society towards stoppers. So, so that's why it's important, but symbolically and practically, that the state would recognise trappers as an ethnic group and put to bed once and for all this subtext to the narrative that we as a community are somehow backward, primitive and dysfunctional. A group of people who need to be basically saved from themselves, which in fact, is, I would argue, is, is quite racist. Racism um, is the underlying issue, okay, that... That, that affects travellers in so many ways, that restricts and creates barriers to travellers' opportunities in terms of employment opportunities, access to healthcare, uh, accommodation provision, uh, uh, education. We've seen there recently where a young traveller boy, in terms of the enrolment policy in the secondary school in, uh, in Clamell and County Tipperary, that the school enrolment policy was designed in such a way that it had a disproportionate impact on travellers, and in this case, but also probably on other, other groups, new communities, and, and so forth. So in other words, in that case, which went all the way to the Supreme Court, there the school had a criteria that either you had either a parent or an older sibling must have gone to that school in order for you to be eligible uh, to get a place in that school. This young traveller boy, his parents were of a generation that statistically, back in the day as it were, hardly any travellers went to secondary education, okay? And plus he was the oldest in the family. So that policy, disproportionately impacted on him. And I would argue it was inherently discriminatory. Uh, the Supreme Court upheld the school's admission policy. And I would argue that that decision effectively legalized uh, institutional uh, discrimination towards uh, travelers. Um, so racism is, 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 a, is a huge issue that, that has many effects on, in so many ways on, on, on travelers' lives. And as we all know, this, this racism is informed by an ideology, a set of beliefs and values which, which presupposes that one group of people or one community is inherently superior and another group is inherently inferior. And that's the ideology that prevails in an Irish context vis-a-vis -vis the relationship between uh, travellers and the majority population. That ideology that presupposes one group is better uh, than the other. Another core principle of Pabby Point is the whole concept of self-determination and travel participation. Okay, uh, We base ourselves on the premise that there can be no significant or meaningful change in our situation unless travellers themselves are empowered and given the tools to be agents of that change. So we need to, we need to be, you know, we need to be perceived as being key uh, in, in affecting positive change for travellers. Uh, when we talk about self-determination, nobody's talking about a separate homeland or a flag or, or, or an anthem, and, you know, and so forth. We're talking basically, basically here about travellers having the right to be sitting at the table whenever state institutions are developing uh, uh, policies or programs that impact on our lives. Now, you might think that's quite uh, sensible, it's quite reasonable, but in fact, it wasn't too long ago when travellers were not at the table, travellers were not invited into these processes where policies and, and programs and decisions were being taken that impacted on our lives. So we put a lot of uh, emphasis into upskilling, capacity building, and creating conditions where we can develop the tools to go to these processes and to be, able, to be able to analyze, reflect, and contribute to these processes and hopefully get good policies which can deliver good outcomes for our community in terms of accommodation, education, employment, healthcare, and so forth. So really, an, an essential to all of this uh, capacity building is, 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 is community development, which is about collective action, which is about empowerment, social justice, equality, and, and indeed anti-discrimination. Anti um, so that's a little bit about, about Paddy Point. Um, so when I was thinking about today's event and, and, and the history behind it, you know, I, I, and I think somebody at the beginning made reference, reference to, you know, as we approach the, the centenary of, of 1916, you know, and the first reading of, uh, by Pierce of, of, the, of the proclamation, I, I think it is, you know, in some respects, an, an appropriate time. I think the time is right, you know, for all of us to, both individually and collectiv collectively, you know, critic critically reflect and ask ourselves, have the ideals and the values and the principles enshrined in that do document, have they been achieved? We also need to ask, uh, have we created the, the society as envisioned by Francis and Hannah Shee uh, Scaffolding, a society char characterised by respect for human rights, income equality, social solidarity? And one would have to say that when we look, you know, in the cold light of day, when we look at the hard facts, I would have to say, no, we have not created that society as envisioned by the proclamation uh, and indeed, uh, Hannah and Francis uh, Skeffield. A CSO report published in January of this year, okay, informed us 
that children living in consistent poverty has risen from 6% to 12% between 2008 and 13. It has doubled child poverty. This means that 135,000 children, or one in eight, are experiencing material deprivation, i.e. lack of food, clothing, heating, basically going to school and going to bed at night hungry. We also see a growing gap between the rich and the poor. We have seen, the poor, we have seen how the poor and marginalised communities have been disproportionately impacted by, by austerity, while those with privilege and power have consolidated, their, have cons, have consolidated, consolidated their status. Oxfam uh, a report uh, published recently, I think it was February this year, says that 1% of the world's population will own more than the wealth than the other 99% in a few years, in five years' time. We've seen a growing rise in, individual, in individualism material, and materialism, and also this un, un, unquenchable desire for wealth accumulation, which I think has trumped uh, human rights. We also see the ongoing privatisation and commodification of essential public services, such as health, education and so on. In addition, we have seen how the community sector has been dismantled and silenced. So there's a big gulf, a big gap between where we are now and where we, where we want to get there. And as I say, we've seen the community sector you know, uh, completely dismantled under, the, uh, under the, the alignment process. And these community groups are providing essential services to the poorest and, and the most marginalised uh, communities in society. Gives a voice uh, 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 to, these, to these communities. So that's uh, just a little bit by way of, 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 of background. So all of the research uh, and all of, the doc all, of the, all of the documents, and by and large, these documents haven't been produced by any travel organisation. They've been done independently by international eminent human rights bodies and indeed our own domestic human rights, uh, rights bodies. But it is quite clear that travellers in Ireland are excluded both politically, economically, culturally and socially. Okay? And we can see you know, the many uh, manifestations of this. We see it in the lo lower health status of travellers. For example, a traveller man living on average 15 years less than his settled counterpart. A traveller woman living on average 12 years less than a settled woman. The infant mortality rate being four times higher than the national average. We see it in the low, in the low educational attainment. 55% of travellers seized a full-time education before 15 uh, uh, years of age. Only 1% of travellers managed to go on to third level uh, education. We see another manifestation of it in terms of accommodation. Almost 1,000 travellers uh, in need of accommodation, essentially living on the side of the road without access to basic services such as running water, sanitation, refuse collection, electricity supply, so on. We've seen travel accommodation budget being slashed from 40 million in 2008 down to 4 million in 2013. That 4 million would not provide 30 units of accommodation in any given year. So it's it certainly will not uh, uh, meet the need. We see travellers being discriminated against in terms of accessing goods and services. We see travellers' experience of racism being denied. We see traveller ethnicity uh, 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 being, uh, being denied. So these are, are, are the challenges, are the challenges, are, are challenges that, that we are facing. One of the consequences of not acknowledging travellers as an ethnic group and not acknowledging that our experience is one of racism is that we are excluded from many of the uh, intercultural anti-racist initiatives that the government uh, are developing. For example, in October of 2013, the Joint Directors Committee on Justice and Equality carried out an inquiry into racism in, in, in Ireland, obviously. But the terms of reference only related to new communities. So travellers and other people who have a, lo have a long history in Ireland, so, you know, black Irish people, Jewish people, were not allowed to, to be part of that process. Okay, so that's quite problematic. The other problem, uh, the other consequence of that is the Office for the Promotion of Migrant Integration, okay, are developing a new integration and inclusion strategy. Okay, they're about to publish that strategy now in May. I understand May of this year. Okay, next month, and that excludes travellers. Despite the fact that we were invited in by that committee, we gave an oral presentation and we also gave a written submission. And I was only informed off the record, and it's on the record now, but off the record a couple of weeks ago that when it's published, travellers will not be included in that. And I think that's uh, uh, unacceptable. Uh, and and. It's, you know, and we're looking to have it, have it addressed uh, by, by the Department of, of Justice. So, as, so that's just a little bit about the context of where we are. So moving forward, uh, there is some positive um, uh, developments. Um, uh, the European Commission has requ required each member state to adopt and implement a national travel Roma 
integration inclusion strategy. So all 28 member states have been asked to do, uh, to do that. Ireland developed this first strategy in 2012. It was quite problematic to begin with because it was very vague. It didn't have any um, targets. It didn't have any time frames. Uh, it didn't have any uh, resource allocation. Uh, it didn't have any monitoring uh, mechanisms. And basically it was also uh, um, um, developed without any, con uh, without any consultation uh, or dialogue with Traveller and Roma organisations. Now, that's, that was back then, 2012. It has now been presently re revised uh, because uh, the European Commission has asked Ireland and indeed other member states to uh, revise their, their, na their national action plans. And thankfully, this time round, it is being done in consultation with Traveller and Roma uh, organisations, uh, which is obviously very positive. Uh, each government department has been asked to develop a new plan, submit it to what's now going to be called the Travel Rome Inclusion Unit, which is Injustice. It was pre previously the Travel Policy Division. Um, there's, there's also going to be the establishment of a new, uh, well, in fact it has been established, a new National Travel Roma Steering Group. It has first meeting there a couple of weeks ago, and that's been chaired by Minister of State, uh, Aon Reardon, which is a, a welcome uh, a development. So these new strategies, uh, this new National Travel Roma strategy, will, uh, people are insisting, and it, I have no doubt that it will contain very specific time-bound actions, uh, resource allocations, and assigning people with, to have a particular uh, responsibility for each element of, of, of that. And the Commission, thankfully, are insisting on that as well, so I, I have no doubt that, that it will happen. Uh, so it's one thing developing the plan and getting the plan in place, but of course, you know, over the years, we have negotiated some good policies with various government departments in terms of education, accommodation, and health. And the challenge, you know, invariably is not in agreeing a policy. Uh, the challenge, unfortunately, is getting those policies uh, implemented, which then will have a positive impact uh, on the experience of Travers and, and Roma on the ground. So that's just uh, by way of... Uh, um, just try and, if you like, set the context and give you a sense of... Uh, some of the issues and some of the challenges that that Pavi Point is is engaging with, and so I, I look forward to the questions and answer session later on. Thank you very much. <laughs>